Thank you, Lord. God bless you this beautiful Sunday. Happy Sabbath, the day that the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice in it. I want to encourage you. Remember, this month of January, we're finishing up with communion. So go ahead and take your get your communion elements. Get you some bread, um, tortilla, whatever you have in the house that will work as bread. And get you some juice preferably grape juice, but if you don't have any, get some water. We will take communion. Amen? I want to just tell you, God is good. He is God, the creator of the universe. Jehovah God, who came to earth as a man like us, Jesus. To pay the price for our sin, our sin that Adam brought into the world. Amen? So today, let's stand and honor the Word, which is the Spirit of God, which is the essence of who God is. Jesus is the Word in the flesh. Let's honor the Word. We're going to read from Luke chapter 4. Verses 13 to 21, and Hebrew, Hebrews 4, 9 to 16. So let's go to the word. Father, may your word go across the land, touching hearts and souls, accomplishing what you will. It is not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. And this word... This word is that sharp two-edged sword that pierces and divides a thunder. So God let it pierce, let it divide soul from Mara and bring, draw your people by the spirit of the word to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke 4, 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he had anointed me, to preach the gospel of the poor, he had sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Amen. Hebrews 4 verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also had seized from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints in the marrow and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, this is your word. I am your servant. Let your spirit rest upon me to speak through me to cause the hearers to be shifted into that realm that you stood in when you were on the earth, seen into heaven and bringing the kingdom of heaven near to everyone who would believe. Let it be so today. I decree and declare that cancers must bow to Jesus and the healing virtues take its place. I decree and declare lack must bow to Jesus and his abundance take its place. I decree and declare the vision, this unity, bow to Jesus and unity and peace take its place. I decree and declare every disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, cataracts, pinch disc, pinch sciatica nerve, Sinus infections, COVID, bow to the knee of Jesus right now. Bow your knee to Jesus. And in its place, the healing virtues of Jesus flow through each that hears and receives and believes by his stripes. I decree healing, healing across the land, healing across the land and every nation healing to lands in the name of Jesus healing to governments in the name of Jesus healing to tribes in the name of Jesus healing to our children in the name of Jesus and God I give you thanks today because you are at work this is your year to show forth your glory make your name famous Lord and begin in this place in me all across the nation, all across the nations of the Canada, Guyana, Mozambique, down in India, Australia, touch Ben in the name of Jesus, Father, wherever your children are, the Philippine, Derek, touch, heal in Jesus' name, Amen. And amen. You may be seated. Listen. God has always been on the move. But I want to tell you now. In 2023. There's a move of God across the nations. In power and might. To save. To heal. To deliver. And I curse the works of the enemy that's coming against every move of God, even now through the internet. In the name of Jesus, God's word, God's truths, God's edicts, God's plans, God's purpose will go forth. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. I want to challenge you to join the fast. It's not too late to join the fast for January. Listen, 
We need to give God our best. We need to believe God's word, God's truth. He showed us all through this word. It said Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Abraham tithed a tenth of all that he had, and therefore Levi in his loins tithed as a result. What you do, your posterity will be impacted. My daughter discovered that one day. She was sitting, I can't remember if we were doing Bible study or just talking. She had started college, and she said, oh, my gosh, Mom, I just realized that everything I do will affect my posterity. Yes, everything we do. And that's why right now we, a lot of us, are suffering for broken things back to the third and fourth generation. Like it says in Isaiah 61, the desolate cities, the, the, the broken things from generations past, for too many generations, it has impacted us negatively. And it's time that we do like, like Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will sor- serve the Lord. And it's time that some of us, I was listening to some of the, the people in the Wisdom Challenge, and one person was saying, when they tithed for the first time, their generation shifted. Because now for the first time in their generation, somebody understood and received the tithing, received and understood it. And they said they began to prosper. And we must give God a tithe, not only of our monies, but our time. When we get up first thing in the morning, we lift our voice. Before we even get out of the bed, we lift our voices up to God and give him our day. In the name of Jesus. And to tell you the truth, according to Genesis 1, day starts at night. So night just before you go to bed, turn your face to the Lord. Turn all that stuff off of TV. That's when we get all that stuff in our mind, in our dreams, and we can't separate God's dreams from the dreams of the stuff that we've been watching, the nastiness. So I want to challenge you. Give God a tithe of your year by fasting in this month of January and decreeing, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I believe you, God. I'm giving these days in this first month to you and trusting you to bless the rest of my year. So it's not too late to join the fast challenge. It's not too late. And I want to encourage you again, turn doing your fast to listening to gospel only. During the fast, put social media down. Some of you are too self-opinionated, you're too selfish and self-centered, and you say things on social media that are going to come back to harm you and your family in the future in ways that you cannot foresee. The words of your mouth are very, very powerful, and you have to not be ensnared by those words that you end up writing on social media. Turn it off. I want to challenge you to study the word. Study the word. Take seven days to just focus on the word. Get a journal and pull up your, your chair in a quiet place when there are no interruptions. Get pencil and paper so that you can quickly jot down things you remember and turn from it. You're going to look at it later. It's jotted down to remember and focus on the Lord. Train yourself. David says, 
he quiet, quieted himself in the Lord like a child that is weaned from his mother. So I want to challenge you, study the word. I want to challenge you to believe God's word. Amen. I see that I am having struggles with the internet, but I'm believing God that you will hear what he says. It's not too late to get in on the 31 Wisdom Challenge by Pedro Adeo, who's a multimillionaire entrepreneur for the Lord. He follows kingdom principles, and he believes that following God, seeking him first, and following his word, all the wisdom is in his word. And we can see it in Proverbs, so it's not too late to get involved in that. Pedro Adeo, Wisdom Challenge. If you can't get on with get on with him live, you can always listen to the replay. But it's going to be done the last day of January. Just listening to to what amazes me with this Wisdom Challenge are the friends that he has who come on this Wisdom Challenge who are also multi-millionaires and to hear them talk about God and how they follow God and how God is the one that's caused them to prosper. It, it's just amazing to see that. The news doesn't put that out. The news puts out all evil, all wrong, all bad. It doesn't show us all the great things that are going on. So I want to challenge you. I've put all these links in the description. And it will not it will not go right away because I wait till I go home to download it and put everything in. But it will be there in the description. All the previous messages f for this month has all these links in the description. Amen. So today, I stand before you as a pastor who's so privileged to be, I, it brings tears to my eyes to think that God would honor me to to use me as his voice. And I'm just awed. I'm just awed. I, as a pastor, desire that this community that I am privileged to be a pastor of, even those online like you, Lydia, I desire that this community loves God deeply, faithfully. I desire to cultivate a culture, a community of people who passionately love their God, a culture that firmly believes their God and diligently and faithfully seeks Him this year, 2023. A community that passionately, faithfully loves their God and seeks diligently after him. What does that look like? What does such a community look like in an hour of great opposition? A people who love their God will stand their ground firmly, firmly rooted and anchored in Christ through the Holy Spirit revealed word. A community that understands their weaknesses and relishing it so that the strength of God may rest upon us. Weakness of not being able to control 
situations, like you go to your job and there's somebody at your job who the enemy has used to dislike you for no reason, and you can't do anything to change that person's mind, and you realize it's a situation that makes you weak. Well, I hope you don't go reacting, but you realize, I need your strength. I need your wisdom in this situation, God. Or a situation where you have no idea how it's going to work out. You've been diligent to tithe. You've been diligent to give. And now you've got more bills than your money. And you don't know how it's going to work out. You've been working diligently. So you trust God that his strength is going to be made perfect in your weakness. A people who glory in their their weakness so that the strength of God may be just poured forth. I don't mean weak. That is sin. That is lazy and irresponsible. And this entitled behavior, I'm not going to work. And you as a Christian are not great if you don't give to me. I'm not talking about that entitled behavior. I'm talking about honest, full of integrity, and the joy of the Lord, doing everything as God would have for the love of God, knowing that God will catapult you victoriously through whatever you're faced in, you're, you're facing as you rest in him. So, to develop and cultivate and protect and keep such a culture of people who passionately love their God, what does God want us to know today? Let's look at a few things. Number one, you need to know that your past and even your current struggles, difficulties, make you an expert in the assignment God has sent you to or is about to send you to. I want to repeat that. Because sometimes we think, like somebody thinks, I'm divorced. Or my husband has left me. So there's no way God can use me. I'm a failure. Your weak area, your difficulty, the struggles that you encounter make you an expert in the assignment God is sending you to. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to go to verse 7. And Paul says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And for this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is Jesus speaking. We'll see it in red in some Bibles. Jesus responded to him when he cried three times, God, remove this thing from me. God says, no, I will not. 
Because when you are weak in this situation, then my strength becomes perfect in you. Why? Because you begin to re- rely on me. You can't do it on your own. You have no strength, no might, no idea what to do. So now you're relying on me. So Paul says in Second Corinthians 12 verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Notice it's for Christ's sake. It's not you being lazy and refusing to go to work and quitting your job every month so you have no money to pay your bills. No, it's persecution that comes even though you're doing the right thing. And he said, our glory in these weak areas, not going and you taking care of it yourself, this person is persecuting me, so I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. No, it's you developing the character of Christ that knows I have to go to Christ about what to do about this. So the first thing you need to know is that that weak area, the struggles you've had with your finances, makes you an expert to be a financial coach. The struggles that you've had makes you an expert. Second thing you need to know today, so we can cultivate that culture of a people who passionately love their God, the second thing thing that you need to know, maybe this is the most important, is that Jesus is our example to follow. Jesus is our example. 1 Peter 2.21 tells us that we should follow in his steps. And it says right there, he suffered. He endured difficulties. And we can see as we look through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we can see the struggles that Jesus endured. So, he chose to please God. And you know, he never asked us, just like he didn't ask Paul to glory in his infirmities, and he didn't go through it, and he didn't understand what it felt like. If we look in John chapter 8, John chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, Jesus said this, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as the Father has taught me, I speak. Speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And so here's Jesus predicting, prophesying, informing the people before his death that after my death, you will know. You will know that I am the one, I am he, I am the I am. And that everything I'm doing right now on earth, I'm not doing it on my own violation. It was preordained by the Father that I do these things. And he says, I always do those things that please him. And so as our example That's what we must strive for. And that's how we develop a culture of people who passionately love their God because they're doing always those things that please him. How do they know what to do that will please him? 
They're in their word with the Holy Spirit, hearing from God. So that's what we need to know. Jesus is our example. The third thing we need to know today to develop that culture of people in the year 2023 that passionately love their God. We know we need to know that Jesus faced opposition from external sources. We see that the first day that he showed up for work, they tried to kill him. Let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 13. Luke chapter 4, verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed for, from him for a season, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogue, being glorified. And it says, when he came to Nazareth, as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And of course, he read that the Spirit of God is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me. And when he was done reading it, in verse 20 of Luke 4, it says, he shut the book, give it to the minister, and while every eye in the synagogue were fastened on him, he said, this day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. This day. And it said to them, it, it's, of course, he had to go ahead and say a few things more. But in verse 29, it says, they rose up, well, let's go to verse 28 of Luke 4, and they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him onto the brow of the hill wherein their city was, that they might cast him down headlong, but he passed through them and went his way. It was not his time to die. But there he is. Because he told the truth. Because he told the truth in such a way. They had never heard before. See they were, they were speaking words. These, these leaders. But when he spoke those same words. That they spoke. He spoke it with such authority. He spoke it and they could feel the atmosphere shift and change. He said he was the one. And they got so angry that they tried to kill him. That first time he went into that synagogue, after coming out of the wilderness, and it's the same with you. You are going to face external forces that would even try their best to kill you. Now they're doing it with witchcraft, casting spells, casting curses. But it is not your time to die. It is not your time. They did not give you that job, so they cannot fire you. But if you don't go in knowing that, understanding it, that Jesus is our example. He faced these external persecutions, these external forces against himself. We will do the same. We will do the same. Too many of us, because of persecution, we choose to abandon our post. Abandon. What, listen, I have gotten myself into debt running this church without the financial support from the people. And God gave me back my job to get me out of debt. And do you think the devil made it easy? No. He tried to run me off through people.
people who just decided they don't like me. But you know what? I knew what God had done. And I say, no, I am not abandoning my post. Neither am I going to get myself embroiled in these chaotic, confused stuff. No, I'm going to pray, trust God, and go about with my head face forward, my forehead as hard as a flint, joy in my heart, a smile on my face, a song on my lips, and do my work. Do my work 101% for the glory of God. So when I get my paycheck, I know I have done my due diligence and that paycheck now can go and get me out of debt. I'm not abandoning my post because of the external forces. But we choose man over God. And this is one of the things that we have to be careful of. We choose to join in with them because we want their approval, their praise, we choose their, whatever they're doing over God, or we choose ourselves over God and we abandon our assignment. When we do, listen, when you abandon the place that God has sent you, chaos is going to ensue all around you because you're out of God's protection there for a moment until you catch yourself and get back into it. He set a path for you. Get on it. Stay on it. You will face external forces. And that's why we meet as a community and pray together for each other. Hold each other up and rejoice. God, look what you've done for me. Nothing can stop me. Nothing stopped him. They took him to the edge of the the city where a cliff was to push him over, but he just went away. They couldn't do it. They can't do it to you. What happens is we give in to the devil's shenanigans because we allow fear, like Job says, a thing that I fear has come upon me. So we need to know we will face external forces against us, just like our example Jesus did. The next thing that we need to know, Jesus not only faced opposition from the external, well, let me, let me look at you a little bit more about the external. I want to look at a couple of scriptures because Jesus said this. John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you will know that it hated me before it hated you. So, if you were of the world, John 15, 19, the world would love his own. They won't persecute you. They'll love you. Not the kind of love that's eternal or lasting. Because as sure as the day is that you go against something they do, they'll pull the rug out from under your feet. Because it's not real love. But still... They will support you if you were their own. But because you're not of the world, but because I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they've kept my sayings, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake because they do not know him that sent me. They do not know God. He said in verse 23 of John 15, he that hates me, hates my father also. And listen, 2 Timothy 3.12, and these are scriptures you need to know and memorize if you could. 
no, you can. Second Timothy three two. Yeah, all those who will live godly in Jesus Christ shall suffer persecution. If you live godly, just as sure as a nose is on your face. People are going to persecute you because the enemy uses them and they allow him to. Because the devil hates God and so of course he doesn't want you to promote God and to show forth that God is who God says he is, that God is faithful. He does not want your testimony to come forth so he will use people to persecute you. They're not going to like you. They're not going to like you because you're sweet and nice and generous and kind, but you keep your character regardless. You be sweet. You be generous. You be nice. You be kind, but don't fall in the trap of manipulative guilt that people bring to you who tell you you're less than you say you are because you confront them. There are times when you have to confront people. Just as Jesus had to confront. Look, if we look, if we look when he was coming in to the city on the, the donkeys, and everybody was praising him. Then he, from all that, all that hallelujah and praise, he went into the temple. And there they were in the temple making his father's house a den of thieves. And he became angry and confronted them. And there are times when you have to confront. And remember your confrontation is because God says, do this. Not because you feel like it. Not because you still have that bad temper character that you haven't turned over to God. So yes, there are times when you have to confront. But just like he did it righteously, you remember he said he never does anything unless the father tells him or he sees the father doing it. So if he confronted them in that temple, it's because his father told him to. So if God tells you confront, you do it and do it the way he tells you to. Get in and get out. Don't do it self-righteously. Don't do it for vainglory. Don't do it in bad temper. Don't do it unsubmitted to God. But as God's servants, we have to confront sin in love. There is no getting around it, especially depending on your role. Are you a parent? You have to confront sin. Are you a pastor? Are you, you've got to confront. You pray, you hear from God, you do what God says, you get in, you get out. Don't expect them to love you. Don't expect them not to hate on you. Sometimes you wonder why, I mean why? It's just the nature of the devil. So you need to know you will face external forces against you. And one of the things that you need to know, you must stop expecting people to like you. Listen, we cannot cultivate a culture of people who passionately love their God if we're expecting people to like us, if we expect to please people. Stop expecting people to see your value and you instead know that God sees your value. Rest in his validation. The ones that he wants to see your value, to set you up, he will let them see it when the time is right. If they're not seeing it, God wants you hidden for a while. Stop pushing forward to try to get noticed. Stop expecting people to like you. Stop expecting people to be pleased with you. Galatians 1.10 Galatians 1.10 
For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. If I seek to please man, I am not a servant of Christ. So we have to choose. We cannot be a people who passionately love God if we're seeking to please people. First Thessalonians 2, 4. First Thessalonians 2, 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which tries our hearts, not as pleasing men. We preach the gospel, not to please men. I told somebody to get out of fornication, to stop sleeping with somebody, and they're mad at me. So what am I supposed to do? Curry favor to her? To please her? No. I've told you the truth over and over and over in love. There's nothing else I know how to do now except put your name on my wall and pray that God blesses you and cares for you. I can't please you and displease my God. Acts 5.29 Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. So we have to be God pleasers. The next thing that we need to know is this. Just like we face external persecution, external forces against us, we'll face internal opposition against ourselves. We see that with our example, Jesus. In Matthew 26, Matthew 26 down to 36, Jesus came with his disciples to Gethsemane. And he told his disciples, sit, sit here while I go yonder and pray. And the Bible says he was heavy and sorrowful. And he says, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. Watch with me. He went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed, Oh, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. He faced opposition inside of himself. The Bible said it was so bad that he sweated as drops of blood. It says in verse 42 of Matthew 26, he went a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, that will be done. And then the Bible goes on to say in verse 44, he went a third time and prayed the same words. He faced that opposition on the inside of him going to the cross. Not that he didn't want to go to the cross, but it meant separation from his beloved father as he went to hell. As he stood on the cross with all of our sins on him, and as he went to hell, he was separated from his father for three days and three nights, and he knew it. And it was it was unbearable. So he faced that opposition. We also will face opposition in ourselves. So how do we develop a culture? How do we protect it? How do we cultivate it? Where God is passionately loved and therefore obeyed. Because that's the only way we can show him that we love him. We obey him. He says, if you love me, you will obey me. How do we do it? We do it not in our, listen, too many, like one person told me, I'm a Christian. I serve God just like you do. Yes, but they serve God in their own strength. 
do it in their own wisdom. You cannot please God in your own strength. You cannot please God in your own wisdom. You cannot. We've got to turn to him through the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is fully God, but absent from heaven. Because he came to earth. Jesus sent him like they passed the baton. When Jesus went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit of God to be with us 24-7, 365, and even 366, to teach us the word, which is also spirit. This is the only time the author shows up when we read the book. The Holy Spirit will teach us through this manual, how to possess our souls, how to stand against the external persecutions, how to stand against the internal struggles. Jesus said, as we come down to the end of the message, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Listen, you need to understand what the word says it says you are crucified with christ nevertheless nevertheless i am crucified with christ nevertheless i live but not i that live but christ who lives in me and this life that i now live in the flesh i live by the faith of the son of god who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't live for my own. I don't live by my own strength. The Christ in me, through his Holy Spirit, because of the blood that he shed, the Christ in me, that I understand, through reading his word with the Holy Spirit, he tells me how to confront or not my enemy. How to leave it alone in his hand. How not to go and say, well, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. No. That's the problem. We give everybody a piece of our mind and we got none left. We have the mind of Christ. Because of the word of God. If you're not in the word of God, you can't have the mind of Christ. The potential is there. But you have to unlock it. It's like an acorn. The oak tree is in the acorn, but we have to plant it, and then we have to cultivate the soil for that acorn to become an oak, a mighty oak. Same with us. Christ is in us, but we have to cultivate that truth, that spirit of truth with the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. Acts 17, 28 says, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's how we cultivate a, a culture that passionately loves God. We understand that in him we live and move and have our being. Not in our own flesh. Not in our own strength. Not in all the gurus' wisdoms out there. Not in all the self-help books. I'm not saying anything is wrong. I'm saying if we're not in Christ living for him, by him, because of the Holy Spirit of God in us, through the word that he reveals to us, because we're pulling our chair up, pulling our table up, turning our plate up and reading the word with him, then we're not going to develop a culture that passionately loves the Lord. Romans 14, 8 says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord. We belong to the Lord, so we should live as if we do. Hebrews 2.9 says, But we see Jesus, our example, by the way, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, 
should taste death for every man. He tasted death for every human in the entire world. How do we develop that culture that passionately loves the Lord? Therefore, we're obeying him. We rest in Jesus, our example. We rest in him. How? Through the word revealed by the Holy Spirit. Through gathering together. Through prayer. It's a daily thing. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4 again. We read it in the opening. Well, some of it we read, not all. Hebrews 4, 9 says, There remains a rest to the people of God. He that enters into God's rest has ceased from his own works as God did from his. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. God showed us from the beginning. He worked seven, six days. He rested on the seventh. You can't rest if you don't have, if you haven't worked. Work is desirable. Some of you hate working, and that's why you are in such trouble. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest of God. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and as a discerning of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there's nothing, no creature that is not seen by God. All things are open and naked before God. He sees everything. First Peter 23, 25 says this. Being born again. We are born again. Not of corruptible seed that dies. Like I had to throw out some fruit yesterday because they rot. We're not born of seed that is corruptible. We're born of incorruptible seed by the word of God which lives and abides forever. John 6:63 6, tell us the word is spirit and life. Continuing in 1 Peter in 1 Peter 1:24 all flesh is as grass and the glory of man as a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower thereof fall away. But the word of the Lord will endure forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. That's how we cultivate a, a, a culture that passionately loves the Lord. Everything that I told you, we see it. I found it in the word revealed to me by the Spirit of God. So let's conclude. I'm going to conclude by reading Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, that is, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hold your profession fast. I had a dream. I don't know if it's a dream. I, I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing that was said in the dream. Before I went into this dream, or I don't know, I was telling the Lord how frustrated I am about so many things that seem like failures to me. Like, for instance, opening this church at his behest for over a year and keeping it open and having nobody show up like today 
and how frustrating that is because to me, it's failure. And I went into, I don't know if it was a dream, but I was sitting in a classroom and I saw in front of me a chalkboard and some of the things that were written, it says this, if you are a failure, you are a legend. If you are a failure, you are a legend. And so I got up at 522 and wrote the dream that I saw. And I looked up. What does it mean to be a legend? And it says to become a legend, it's something that you do memorably like no one else. Something you do because it makes you fulfilled and whole. Legend means you've done something awesome. And then I looked up, it says 13 legends. Number one was Jesus. Albert Einstein was in there. Isaac Newton was in there. And these are people who failed at what they do. So many times, like creating the light bulb. So many times, who's the one who created the light bulb? At Edison. So many times he did it and failed. And I think it's at the 69th time, 69th time, I'm looking at the light bulb now, looking right into a light in the light bulb. 69 times, the 69th time, he created that. He was able to cause the light bulb to be created that all over the world people use. So your failure doesn't disqualify you. Your failure is that thing that you become an expert at if you allow the God, the, the God of the universe who loves us to, be, to, to use you. And so we, we can't give up because things go wrong. We can't give up because our husband is mad at us. We can't give up because our husband walked out on us. We can't give up because the people at our job don't like us. We can't give up because we can't pay the bills. We cannot give up. We got to hold fast to our profession. Why? Verse 15 of Hebrews 4, we have a, we have a high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. As a matter of fact, it's written in the negative form because I think it's clearer, but I didn't want to say it and get my tongue twisted up. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points. What, what are you tempted in? He was tempted in all points. Just as we are tempted, he was a man on earth. He chose to leave his deity. He chose to leave his kingship. He chose to leave his throne to become one of us. He was tempted like us in every area, yet without sin. He did not give in to the sin. And he showed us that because of him in us, we too can do it. So, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen? How do we develop a culture where we see those miracles? Because we hear God says speak. We see God says move. It's like when my daughter went on the school bus, she was in private school, and then we put her in public school, and she only lasted six months in the public school, because whenever she'd get on the bus, because she was light-skinned and had long hair, they would pull her hair, they would steal her homework, and in the mornings, I literally had to beat her some days to get her to come and comb her hair because she was making me late because she couldn't get on the bus. I didn't understand why she, she was reluctant to get on the bus. The Lord helped me to see eventually that I wasn't doing right by her, that I needed to ask her what was going on. That's when I found out what she was enduring 
on that bus. This this was a beautiful and still is a beautiful child, tender hearted, loving. Never give me any trouble. The most trouble that that girl has ever given me is sweeping her dirt under the refrigerator instead of picking it up. Is keeping her room messy. That's what I had struggles with with her. Messiness. And here she was getting a lick in for making me late because she wouldn't get on the bus. Not realizing they were persecuting her on the bus because of the color of her skin. It wasn't dark like theirs because her hair was too long. Because she spoke too well. Because she had homework in her hand. And when I went to the Lord, and I'm bemoaned because I didn't have money to put her in the pub, back into private school, I saw, I saw in silhouette the Lord. He said, write a check. I saw that. Write a check. He'll give grace to help in time of trouble. Amen. This is the God we serve. Let's take communion and end. What have you heard today? We seal it by remembering. Oh God, your body was broken for us. And you said to your disciples, do this. Take the bread and eat in remembrance of what I did of what I've accomplished for you, taking your place on that cross. And though they didn't understand at the time, we understand now in hindsight, take and eat. And then he took the cup and he told them, I will not drink from the vine with you again until the marriage supper of the Lamb. They did not understand. They didn't understand. They had no idea what it meant when he said they'll kill him, that for three days he'll be in the ground. They they didn't understand at the time, but we understand now in hindsight, this blood, his blood is the covenant that he made with us, sealed it for us, give us the Holy Spirit himself in spirit form as a down payment for what is to come. Not only when we get to heaven, but right here on earth. He wants us to make a kingdom impact. He wants us to prosper, not for us, but for his kingdom to be impacted. And this is the covenant he made with us, his blood drink. I dare you to believe. I dare you to believe the truths in this word as you call on the Holy Spirit who is fully God to reveal his truths to you. I boldly declare over you the acceptable year of the Lord. I boldly declare over you the day of vengeance of our God against the enemy of our soul, who even now is going to make people look at this message, and because it's not sinking, at least it's not sinking correctly, then they don't want to listen. But I decree and declare the word is going forth, and the people will hear and be set free. Be set free by the word of God. Be set free by the spirit of the living God. In the name of Jesus, be set free. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Repair those desolate places in the name of Jesus. The generations of the desolation of many generations. Be the first to break cycles in your generation by doing the right thing as Jesus said in this word. Amen. God bless you and strengthen you. Lydia, be encouraged. And I'll talk with you Thursday, should he say the same. Be blessed. Hallelujah.